Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 205. For this one, we're in the Austin Round Rock area at the Lodge. We're playing high stakes, and there are so many huge hands that uh, it, was, it was tough to cram them all in this episode. That's why it's so long, but um, it's one of the most exciting episodes that I put together, so I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Also, I'm gonna be at the Lodge April 26th through May 1st, and then I'll be, I'll be out there again in the middle of May for the last week of the Lodge Championship Series. May 22nd, I am gonna be uh, co-hosting a meetup game with Doug and Andrew. So if you're interested in attending, I have more information in the description box below. Hope to see you guys there. And uh, also, if you haven't yet subscribed, I'd appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button. All right, let's go ahead and get started. We're heading back to my favorite city to visit, Austin, Texas. This place really has it all, including some of the best barbecue in the country, great shopping, and incredible nightlife. There are places all over that have delicious craft cocktails. If you ever make it to 6th Street, you've got to check out Pete's Dueling Piano Bar. It's one of Andrew Nimi's favorite places. Oftentimes, you'll see him come here after long poker sessions, requesting the musicians to play Sweet Caroline over and over again. Yep, the city has it all, including the $15,000 I left here on my previous trip during Monster Meetup Week in January. I'm back at the lodge with a vengeance to recover every last penny. The entire room is filled to the brim since we're in the middle of the Spring Mayhem Series main event. It's a $1,200 buy-in tournament with a $1 million guarantee. That guarantee gets obliterated. The total prize pool cleared the $2 million mark, with first place being awarded over a quarter million, along with the sweet trophy. The trophies here really are some of the coolest that I've seen in poker. I'm focused on cash games at the moment. It's my third day playing on this trip. I got stuck piles my first hour playing, but battled back and ended up winning small the first two sessions. Today is by far the most important session for me while I'm out here this month though. It's Friday, which is when Doug usually hosts his weekly high stakes cash game. He happens to be out of town, so I'm stepping in to take my shot and either add to my deficit here or get a big chunk back if I can run good. We're playing what's listed as an uncapped 5-5-10 game, but I know with multiple straddles going nearly every hand, it's going to play way bigger. I'm in for 4,000 to start. We begin the session at 2.19 p.m. About 10 minutes in, I'm still getting situated when we pick up pocket kings on the button. At least I think I'm the button, because we see that big button looking thing in the top left. That's actually the bomb pot button. I'm in the small blind. With the session just starting, me playing in a big game, getting pocket kings and trying to get the camera set up all at once, I'm a little distracted. Under the gun plus one raises to 55. I played with this opponent the day before and know that he's a wild guy. He also knocked Doug out of the main event a few days prior after calling a three bet with eight three offsuit and flopping trips. I must avenge Doug. I three bet to 160. I would have made it 200 if I had realized that I'd be playing this from out of position. The opponent calls, we're going heads up to the flop. It's reminiscent of what the judges gave me for my mime act during my high school talent show. That's right, all tens. The act was sick. I was in a box and everything. We flop an interesting full house. If my opponent has a pocket pair below tens, he's drawing dead to run a runner perfect. I down bet to 125 in order to string the opponent along as if I'm walking the dog with a yo-yo. The opponent complies and makes the call. I'm already trying to think about how I can extract maximum value throughout the rest of the hand. The turn is the six of diamonds. It's a great card. I don't want to see anything above a 10 come out, not even a king. I increase my sizing to 475. Under the gun plus one isn't deterred by my bet. Only about 10 seconds go by before he calls. As we're getting further into this hand, I'm suspecting more and more that my opponent has exactly queens or jacks. Or you know, quads. If he flopped quads and I get stacked, I can live with that though. The river is the four of clubs. It's another card that doesn't change a damn thing. The dealer could have just put his business card out there instead. I'm gonna bet, and I'm gonna bet big to target worse pocket pairs. I make it 1500. I actually wouldn't have minded jamming for about 3300 total. You can't really fold queens for that amount since that's the second best hand that I'll ever have other than four tens. Under the gun plus one is clearly distraught at the moment. He's not sure what to do. He has no phone or friend lifeline at his disposal. I'm rooting hard for a call, but maybe 1500 was a bit too greedy. Maybe it wasn't greedy enough. The opponent matches the bet. We show him the two cowboys. They're more than good. We never find out what under the gun plus one has as his cards are returned to the dealer face down. We're up over 2,000 immediately. We win back more from the opponent than he got from Doug's tournament buy-in. Doug has been completely avenged. It seems like we're up a lot. After all, it's an amount more than 200 big blinds. Big blinds just aren't really an accurate way to measure anything out here since just a few minutes into the session, we've got multiple straddles on. We're playing 5, 5, 10, 20, 40, 80, and I've got the 160 out there. We do a round of this, causing the action to be insane. 
For this particular hand, there's a three-way all-in with players getting in with ace-jack suited versus ace-do suited versus ace-queen suited preflop for several thousand each. Ace-jack wins by drilling straight on the river, leaving trip queens in the dust. Five minutes later, we see another all-in preflop for a couple thousand effective. They run it twice, with the player on my left having ace-jack offsuit. You'd think that wouldn't be a very good hand to have when you're shipping it for 2500 or so, but he actually was way ahead of his opponent's jack-10 of hearts. Hearts gets there to make a flush on the top board, so they ultimately chop up the money. With all this insanity, things can change quickly. It's important to run good because there's a lot of gambling going on. If the cards don't run out in your favor, it's easy to get torched for five figures or more. It's time for a $25 PLO double board bomb pot. We look down at Ace and the sign of the devil. Luckily, the first flop is 876. We have four sixes, but not quite the way we want them. The second flop is Ace Ace 9. We've got three of a kind on that board as well. Not bad for us. I'm in middle position and bet 125. I can't get past one person. The hijack raises to 375. This is super annoying. My hand seems fairly strong, but I could be completely crushed if my opponent has something like pocket nines with a 10 or 5. Even if my opponent has the case ace with three random cards, he'll likely win the bottom board since I have zero cards left that'll give me a full house there. So trip aces with a guaranteed six kicker isn't really as strong as it seems at first glance. Set of sixes on the top is okay, but it's only the six nuts. The issue is that the player who raised me is the wildest person at the table. We already saw him get in in preflop for several thousand with ace-2 suited, and then again with ace-jack offsuit. He's stuck and shown a huge willingness to gamble. If I don't take stands in certain spots, I'm going to get completely pushed around while bleeding hundreds of dollars out or more at a time. I've already had to fold in spots after putting in a few hundred only to see this exact opponent raise or get it all in with something marginal. Over a thousand dollars of my profit is dissipated without me even being able to see a flop. I take a stand here and I pot it for $13.25. Perhaps I'll be up against some type of bluff or combo draw. The opponent only has $12.90 on top of the $13.25, so I don't anticipate getting called. I expect to either see a fold or a jam. Surprisingly, the opponent just flats. He may not be all that strong on at least one board. The top turn is the three of spades. The bottom turn is the eight of hearts. I'm not feeling great about the situation I've gotten myself into. This is a big pot, and I only have two kind of mediocre hands. The good news is that if my read is correct about the opponent being too apprehensive to want to put all of his money in on the flop, then we likely have the winner on at least one board. There's no point in checking because I'll have to call an all-in for $12.90 anyway. I take the initiative and shove. The opponent snap calls, which I didn't want to see. We're playing a pot well over $5,000. I don't know what I can hit, if anything, to at least give me a chop. If I'm up against a hand containing pocket eights, for instance, I'm drawing stone dead. The first river is the nine of spades, allowing a lot of the hands that I was hoping to be up against to make a straight. That's not good. The second river is the five of diamonds, making it so in the very unlikely scenario that I was up against ace five four three or another ace five high, I'm losing on that board as well. Altogether, not great. The opponent shows first, though he's not obligated to do so. This is not a good sign. He has ace jack eight five. He actually had a hand that was incredibly vulnerable when he called my re-raise since he could have been drawing dead if I had ace ten nine or a ten with two nines. Instead, he turns the second nuts on the bottom board and rivers a straight where I've got a set of sixes. With all the cards out there for PLO and two boards, it's difficult to sort out what everyone has, especially with multiple players chiming in. Drop it. Oh, shit. For about five minutes, I'm completely dejected as my profit has all disappeared and I'm down $1,700. It appears that my woes at the lodge are going to continue. Then, well after the pot has been pushed to the opponent, the player on my right comes to the rescue and speaks up by saying that he thinks that I won half the pot. With everyone focused on how many sixes I have, and them saying repeatedly that the opponent scooped the pot, nearly all of us, myself included, didn't realize that I made a backdoor flush on the top board where the opponent only had a straight. We have to check the cameras and we even check my footage to make sure that I really did win half the pot. We eventually confirm that there are three spades out there and I've got the absolute nuts. The opponent is happy to give me what's rightfully mine. It can definitely be awkward to ask someone to give you half of their stack several minutes after the hand has ended, but the player's cool about the whole thing, just wants the outcome to be a fair one. I'm feeling much better about the day now because I'm still up over a thousand. 20 minutes after that debacle, we pick up King-9 suited in the $10 blind. We'll just call it under the gun since we have two other players in the blinds to our right. Under the gun plus one straddles the 20, the button raises to 60. His name's Matt. I played with him a handful of times in Texas. He's maybe the best cash game player in town. With the straddler behind me, I'm treating this as if I'm in the small blind and I three bet to 200. 
Had I had an opportunity to close the action, I would have just called the initial raise. Under the gun plus one doesn't see that I three bet and calls the 60. Once he realizes it's 200 to call, he wishes that he could have folded. It's another strange situation because he's not really supposed to be allowed to take his 60 back. Matt is a stickler for the rules and tries to clear up the confusion by chiming in. I don't want to win someone else's money that he genuinely put in as a mistake, so I want to try and let him know that if he folds and I win the pot, I'd give him back his $60, but I don't want to make it seem too much like I want the opponents to fold. 140 to call, zero to fold. No, 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 that's yours. You called 60. You called 60. If I win, oh, well, we'll see what happens. Yes. I'll give you. Uh, okay. Now we're all we're all just playing poker. Under the gun plus one makes things simpler by calling. Matt calls as well. We're going three ways to the flop against someone who I think has a bad hand and someone who I think has something mediocre, like a low or medium pocket pair, suited connectors, or suited Broadway cards, aside from ace king or maybe even ace queen. The flop comes king queen five rainbow. We've got top pair and a backdoor straight flush draw. What's better is that I have a huge range advantage with two Broadway cards out there after three betting and only getting called. I'll have extremely strong hands like sets of kings and queens, as well as aces and ace king that my opponents almost definitely won't have. After under the gun plus one showed hesitation before ultimately calling the three bet for 140 more, it's unlikely that he'd even have a set of fives and probably won't have king queen, which are the only super strong hands that the button could have. With us having a king, there are only two combos of king queen suited that the button would have definitely called a three bet with. I suppose he probably would have called preflop with king queen offsuit as well, but that's still only a total of six king queen combos and three set of five combos that I need to be concerned about him raising me with. Because of that, I can sort of bet with impunity here. I make it 350. Under the gun plus one folds right away. The button is contemplating how he wants to proceed. Eventually he calls. It's down to heads up. The turn is the eight of clubs. I would have preferred it to be a heart, not a bad card though. At this point, it's tough to be sure if we're ahead or not. We're losing against a set of fives, king queen, king jack, and king ten, but we're ahead of ace queen, ace ten, jack ten, perhaps queen jack and queen ten suited type of hands as well. Maybe even some ten nine or seven six suited hands also. I go very large with my sizing since I have the range advantage and good card removal against a lot of combos that are beating me. I bet twelve hundred. This amount charges the button significantly for draws, particularly if he has clubs and doesn't want to fold. If the button has two pair or a set and happen to be trapping on the flop, I'd expect to hear from him right now. He just calls, making me think that he either has exactly one pair or some sort of strong draw. The river is the deuce of hearts, it's a complete blank. What's interesting about the board run out and the way that this hand has been played so far is that I don't think the opponent is going to want to put any more money in the pot regardless of what his actual holding is. If he has a missed draw, he won't be calling a bet, although if I check, he may jam for 34.50 effective in a last ditch effort to steal the pot from me. He's a good enough player to know that shoving on the river wouldn't make a ton of sense though, and I'll certainly check as a trap on occasion with really strong hands. If the button has something like ace queen or queen jack of clubs, he would surely check back. If he has king jack or king ten, he'll be checking back as well since this pot has gotten large and I probably wouldn't call a bet of his with anything worse. The button may call a small or medium sized bet with king jack or king ten, but he won't love it after I three bet and bet all three streets. It'd be only a bluff catcher. Since I anticipate only being up against holdings that can't call large bets, I consider turning my hand into a semi-bluff of sorts in the sense that if I jam for 34.50, I expect to be ahead half the time or more, but the hands that I put my opponent on that are beating me will almost for sure have to fold, so I'm bluffing him off of those. The opponent throws his cards into the muck immediately. I imagine that we had the best hand and didn't necessarily need to turn top pair into a bluff. It just all but guaranteed that we'd win the pot unless the opponent could find a difficult call which is a slightly better one pair. Typically, I don't turn hands with value into big bluffs. This was just a unique situation in which I felt in the moment it was going to give us the victory a huge percentage of the time, particularly after everyone at the table saw me overbet for value on the river earlier with pocket kings after I three bet preflop there too. Matt is a great guy and is cool enough to share what he had for the vlog. Jack 10. Ace 10 of clubs, right? Edgy A half hour goes by, then I turn my hand into a bluff on a double board bomb pot. I've got nothing on the top board and two pair on the bottom board. I make a pot size bet for 1200 on the river after betting 100 on the flop and 400 on the turn. The player on my right seemed hesitant while check calling the previous bets, so I kept my foot on the pedal to hopefully avoid a chop. The opponent folds, we put him in a tough situation to accomplish our goal. He'd later say that he folded trip threes and had a speed on the top board. As this pod's push our way, you can see that we've got about 7,800 in front of us. Those purple chips are 500s. 
Right after this, a guy named Craig would come by out of nowhere and give me another $500 chip. Craig owns Night Owl Poker Tables and has a podcast called Texas Poker Experience. I promoted his poker table company in the past and I'm happy to do it again by including a link to his Instagram page in the description box of this video. Be sure to check that out along with this podcast about everything that has to do with poker in Texas. Him and his co-host Caitlin do an amazing job. He's a family man and a big supporter of vlogs. I really appreciate him. Back to poker, we pick up Queen Jack suited in the cutoff. There's a $20 straddle on, under the gun plus one limps in, the hijack calls as well. I raise to 100. The dude who I got earlier with Pocket Kings and who knocked Doug out of the tournament with 8-3 offsuit, three bets to 305. It folds back to me. My brother actually just landed in Austin to check out the lodge and hang out, so part of me wants to lock up a win for several thousand and head out without getting involved in any more big pots. I know that I shouldn't be making decisions based on that, so I call for 205 more. We're heads up in position, the flop comes 10 to 6 6 rainbow with one club. We don't have much except two overs and some backdoor draws. The big blind only bets 160. I'm getting 4 to 1. I call, hoping to improve or perhaps I can steal this down the line. The turn is the 8 of spades, that gives us a gut shot straight draw. The big blind slows down and checks. This is a pretty good board for my 3 bet calling range. I can have quads, full houses, and trips, as well as hands like ace 10 and king 10. I take a stab at it for 425 in order to get the opponent to at least fold his ace high hands. The big blind calls pretty quickly. He could have an overpair and just checked for pot control. He may have continued betting with spades, so I don't think that it's very likely that he check called with a flush draw. The river is the nine of spades, giving us the best possible straight. Now I'm really hoping that we're up against an overpair. The big blind checks again. If I had missed, I was considering bombing it as a bluff. No need to do that anymore. I bomb it for value. I make it 1500 the same price that I made it against him the last time that we tangled several hours ago. This player's had a rough day so far. Not only did I get the best of him earlier, some other people have gotten him as well. And now, I've just made a backdoor straight against him in a three bet pot that's had betting on every street. If he calls, he's not gonna like seeing Queen Jack. He doesn't call. Instead, he rips it all in for 37.20. I wasn't expecting to see that. I feel like throwing up. It's just over 2200 more for me to call. I'm playing against a wild dude who stuck piles against certain people and in certain situations, this is an easy fold. I'll still be up about $1,000 if I let this straight go. Still, it's difficult for me to put together what my opponent is trying to say with this river check shove. I don't even think that he's attempting to rep a flush. He's basically saying that he has a full house. There's only one full house combo that makes much sense to me. So pocket nines? I've seen this guy make some aggressive plays, particularly in the 2-5 game that I played with him yesterday. In the back of my mind, I also had this text conversation that I had with my friends 20 minutes prior to this hand. We see my friend Nick Durkee say, don't play prevent defense, it doesn't work. With that thought swirling around and against this opponent whose hand I can't quite piece together, I call, it turns out, I actually was able to piece his hand together, he has the exact one that I called out. Nines full of sixes for a river full house. All right. How much is it? 3740. I can't tell you how badly this one hurts. I go from being up a decent amount to now being down 1300. It's not even that much for this game, but I only won about 450 total in the previous two days, and I'm tired of having losing trips at the lodge. I just want one good memory of a session that goes smoothly for me. I update the group chat to inform them that I got crushed. You may notice me calling the opponent a nutball. He's a nutball in a good way for him. He has a good understanding of how poker works and picks spots to make plays that pay off for him down the line. Certainly his image is a big reason why I paid him off in this situation. I add on for 5,000 more, 4,000 of it is in cash, then I add one more yellow bird to the stack after filming this clip, so I'm in for 9,000 total. Or if you consider the 500 that Craig gave to me, I'm more so in for 9,500 and currently stuck 1,800 from my poker play. I don't intend to count the money that Craig gave me in my cash out stats for the session, and I don't want to book a loss, so we've got some work to do. I successfully bluff catch an opponent, then pick up ace three suited on the button the very next hand, Matt raises to 75 in the hijack. By the way, we've changed the game to 5 10 25. I can mix in three betting and calling in this situation. I call, we're heads up in position, the flop comes ace six three rainbow, we've got top and bottom pair. The hijack checks, I bet 125 for value. The hijack calls, the turn is the king of spades giving us the nut flush draw. The hijack checks, I bet 400 when a card comes out that will usually be much better for the pre-flop aggressor. Matt doesn't believe that I've got it. He calls. The river is the eight of spades, giving us the absolute nuts. The opponent checks. What a dream this is. When I make strong and hidden back door hands, I like to bet large. I make it 1100. It could look like I'm trying to buy the pot, especially since Matt has played this passively. He goes into the tank for a long time without saying anything, then finally breaks the silence. I'm not supposed to call, but I'm a little bit suspicious. 
A call from the opponent would actually get me unstuck. I'd be up $200 on top of what Craig gave me. After a full minute, Matt makes the correct decision and folds. The rest of the table is curious whether or not we had it. Throw the ball. No bluffs. No bluffs. I do the whole way. Just five minutes later, we pick up pocket jiggities in the cutoff. There's a $50 straddle on, and since it's a three blind game to begin with, we're first to act. I raised a 150. The button calls. The small blind is a pro named Hunter. He has over a million dollars in tournament earnings. He's also an instructor for Check Shove Poker. He's the author of Advanced Concepts No Limit Hold'em, a modern approach to poker analysis. Hunter three bets of 700 with a stack of 4,800 total. Tough situation for me. There are a few things to consider. One is that Hunter was set up nicely to three bet squeeze after the button just flat in my initial pre-flop raise. This makes me think that he could have three bet me on the lighter side. Also, I don't want to call and give the button a good price to call behind, making it so we potentially have to play this hand from out of position. I've got the fourth best hand in poker. There are plenty of hands that I could have gotten three bet by that are worse than mine. I'm okay racing against a hand like ace king as well. If I happen to be up against aces, kings, or queens, that's a bit unlucky. I four bet jam for 4,800 effective. The button folds quickly. If I get called by the small blind and win, I'll be at the high point for the day. Even if it folds through, I'll have 300 more than I walked into the card room with. Hunter's perplexed, which I'm very happy about. I can rule out him having pretty much everything that beats me or is flipping with me. It's never all that fun to four bet shove with jiggities. This time the play works out, the small blind folds, we get the victory without having to see a flop, our stack is at 9,300. Remember, we're in for 9,000 of our own dollars, but we were given 500, so we're still 200 away from getting all of our dollars back from this game. Next we've got queen eight suited in the small blind. I actually got a nice bluff through right before this to be winning on the day, even beyond the purple chip gift. I raised to 85. Under the gun calls, this is the Lodge Ownership Group's nemesis. He got Doug, I avenged Doug, then he got me for more than I avenged Doug for, so he's up all the YouTube money right now. We're heads up, out of position, the flop comes, King, Queen, Jack, Rainbow. Pretty good flop since we'll have all the sets in our range that the opponent won't have. He can still have some two pair and straight combos though. I'd like to get our second pair to showdown as cheaply as possible. I check, Under the Gun is sorta of playing by the rules, he bets 50. That's a reasonable amount, I call. The turn is the deuce of heart, it's as blank as it gets. I check. This time, under the gun bets 200. Second pair is an okay candidate to call two streets with. I put 200 in the middle. If I face a third barrel, I'll just fold. The river is the eight of clubs, improving our hand to two pair. It's a sneaky two pair as well. I check. I'm planning to call any normal size bet. The opponent fires for 1300. That's not a normal size bet. I've got great card removal to the other two pair hands. I played this passively, and the river helped me improve to just about the best hand that I'd ever play this way. Does this guy just always have monsters against me? I'm not sure. I call to find out. We get the bad news. The opponent flopped the nuts with ace, ten of diamonds. Yeah, seems about right. How much is it? 1300. This guy really is our nemesis. He's 2-1 against me in massive pots. Every time I get something going, he comes in and knocks me down to the low point of the day. Someone at this table is going to have to pay, whether that's him or Phil Ivey if he comes in and takes a seat, or Hunter Sitchi when he raises to 125 from the button. This started out as a 5-10-25-50 hand. I'm in the under the gun straddle. I'm having none of it. I put in an ill-advised 3-bet to 400, mostly because I'm feeling lucky and people are missing from the table, so we've got to either form a search party to bring him back or we need to be fighting for pots more aggressively. The button calls, we're heads up out of position, the flop comes ace ace six with two clubs, we flop trips. I down bet to 300 in order to keep Hunter in with his pocket pairs or other hands that are drawing slim. The button calls, the turn is the jack of hearts, I check to see how confident the opponent is in his hand. If he checks back, I'll know for sure that we've got him beat. He does check, I doubt he'd do that with trips or better. The river is another jack giving us a full house. If Hunter called my flop bet with a smaller medium pocket pair, he may have gotten counterfeited, he won't be able to call a bet. The same is true if he has a missed flush draw. I check to feign weakness in order to induce a bluff. The button bet's 300. That's a cool sizing, but it's not going to stay that amount. I raised to 1500. Hunter snap folds what I'm guessing is complete air. This pot gets our stack back up to the 9k mark. We just need to win a little more. Here we've got jack 4 clubs in the under the gun plus 1 straddle. It's another 510 2550 hand. Hunter's out to get revenge against me. He raises the 200 from the small blind. I'll give him an opportunity to get some of his money back. I defend the straddle. We're heads up in position. Every one of these pots we're playing has the potential to get huge quickly. The flop comes queen nine six rainbow. We've got nothing except backdoor draws. Small blind bets 300. 
We've got position and a lot of cards that can help us on the turn. The opponent could just be taking a stab at it and will give up on future streets, allowing us to possibly steal it later. I call one time to see what develops. The turn is the King of Diamonds, giving us a straight draw. We also have pretty good card removal, making it less likely that we're up against a straight or a hand like King Jack or Queen Jack. The small blind slows down and checks. So far, this is going about how I drew it up. I just need to bet, have Hunter fold, and stack the chips. I make it 850 to mostly represent a straight. I could also play some sets and two pair hands this way as well. Hunter goes off script. He calls. He wasn't supposed to do that. It seems that he may have a hand like Ace Queen or Queen 10. The river is another king. The small blind checks. I hope that he didn't check call on the previous street for pot control with the king, then improved the trips. We've completely bricked. We've got about the worst hand that we'll ever have. Don't worry about that though. Think about the hands that we could have that we would have played this way like King Queen, King 9, Pocket 9s, Pocket 6s, and Jack 10. I may even play King Jack or King 10 this way as well. Once a small blind check calls the turn, he's going to have very few of those hands. My goal is to appear strong and get the opponent to fold. I announce a bet of 1800. This should look like we're going for pure value. It should look like we want to get called. When I bet rivers for similar amounts previously at this table, even though they were for larger percentages of the pot, they mostly have been for value. I want Hunter's hands containing a queen to fold. If this play gets through, it'll put me well above the even mark, and it'll get the stack into five-figure territory. A full minute goes by, and a top-level pro with multiple six-figure scores from WSOP and WPT final tables is no closer to coming to a decision. While he's tanking, no one says a word in order to allow him to concentrate. There's a big pot and a friendly table, so no one's considering calling the clock either. I'm trying to remain as still as I could possibly be to not give anything away. After almost exactly two minutes of tanking, Hunter finally decides that he can find a better spot and he folds. We get the biggest complete bluff through of the day. This one feels unbelievable after the roller coaster that we've been on. A huge sense of relief comes over me as our stack climbs to 10,300. What's even better is that my older brother Matt just arrived at the lodge for the first time. He's one of the main reasons that I started playing poker. When I was around 15 and he'd come home from college, we'd sit around the kitchen table playing for a few dollars with his friends. I love doing that. Now almost 20 years later, I'm playing with a lot more at stake. I'm ready to go, but I don't want to hit and run, so I play another $25 PLO double board bomb pot with King King 7-4 and two hearts on the button. It's six-handed. The first flop comes out Queen Queen 4 rainbow, not ideal. The second flop is 9-6-4 rainbow. The big blind bet's 75. It seems premature to fold here, even though I'm pretty content to give up and hit the town. I call one time. The small blind also calls. We're going three ways to the turn. The first one is the Jack of Hearts giving us a flush draw. The second one is the Nine of Hearts, we're just playing Kings there. At this point, the small blind leads for 350. The big blind folds, there are a handful of reasons that I could give for folding at the moment. Sometimes you have to have a little heart and stick around though. I call. Small blind leads tend to be pretty suspect. The top river is the Three of Hearts giving us a flush. The second river is the Five of Hearts, we're still playing Kings on that board, but we have removal making it less likely that we're up against a boat or a straight there. The opponent bets 1,075. I called a thousand dollar bet on the river in a similar spot earlier and ended up chopping. I also folded in a similar spot in another PLO double board bomb pot when I would have chopped. I'm not getting away from this after making the backdoor king high flush. I call. We're not chopping or even winning a small morsel of this pot. The opponent has a hand so good he doesn't even realize how strong it is. He has the nuts on both boards with queen jack 9-9. He has a full house on the top board and somehow unknowingly has quads on the bottom board to wreck my session, day, week, trip to Austin, world, and now this episode of the poker vlog. 1,075. One more time, we're back in the hole. All I wanted to do was get out of here with the win and hang out with my brother. It doesn't look like that's gonna happen, but it might. We get one last chance with pocket tens the very next hand. I raise a 75 from the button. The small blind, who's the same opponent who just got me in the bomb pot, three bets to 300, using the money that he just won from our stack. Calling is the most reasonable play. I put 225 more out there. We're heads up in position. The flop comes king 10 8 with two clubs. We have a set and the second nuts. Small blind bets 325. There's too much going on at this board for us to slow play. I raise to 1000. Small blind thinks for 30 seconds. Then he calls. I'm hoping that he has ace king and not ace queen because the jack of spades comes out on the turn. It's a terrible card for us. Three different straights get there, and a set of jacks is beating us now too. Plus, there are two flush draws on the board. The small blind checks. While a big part of me is concerned that we're already beat, I can't allow hands like ace king, king queen, queen jack, king jack, and flush draws to see free cards. I bet 1700. Now we wait. It's possible that we'll get raised or jammed on. 
I don't know if I'll be able to fold if that's what happens. I'm nervous since I don't know where we're at in this. People keep showing up with nuts, or in the case of the last hand, the nuts twice. After well over a minute, the opponent finally folds. He obviously didn't fold anything better than our set, but I'm somewhat relieved that we don't have to fade a river card. We're unstuck for the fourth time today. And again, cross the $10,000 mark. It's been a complete roller coaster. We need to book a win and get out of here. One of the most eventful sessions that I've ever played. Um, I don't know how many times I got stuck and unstuck and then stuck again, uh, but uh, I played for six hours and I won $620. So I cashed out for $10,120. But this guy, Craig from uh, Night Owl Poker Tables, really nice guy. He's also got a podcast. He came by and he just gave me $500 out of nowhere. So uh, that was awesome. Uh, I'm not counting that in my, my poker winnings for today, um, but uh, wow, that was an incredible day. Did some wild things and, uh, you know, made some calls that didn't work out, but yeah, I'm just really, really glad to, to book the win. Um, the place is packed right now. There's a $1,200 main event going on, and then there's a ton of cash games, so this is so cool just to be like a part of this and um the lodge in austin has just become a great a great place for poker so i'm uh, very excited my brother's here and uh we're gonna go out and uh, maybe watch a comedy show or something it's my brother's first time in austin we have a blast going to different comedy clubs in the area we enjoy some of the fine dining options and for the first time ever my brother plays a live no limit cash game in a card room I have a much better trip than I did in January. Not only do I make a straight flush in a three-way all-in PLO double board bomb pot for piles, I see a royal flush dealt on board, and I win all five of the sessions that I played to get $4,000 back of the money that I lost on my first trip. I still have about 11000 to go to get even at this property, but I'm looking forward to the challenge. That's it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate it. If you hit the like and subscribe buttons because it helps out the channel a ton. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comment section. I'm happy to get back to you. This was uh, definitely one of the wilder sessions that I've ever played. Um, it's always really interesting for me to play high stakes. I was hoping that everything was gonna go smoothly and it seemed like I was on that path. I was up 4,000 at the high point and then after that queen jack hand, you know, I was down. I think, well, I ended up being down around 2,000 at the low point, but uh, luckily I got in and out of the hole several times after that, which makes for a fun video, but like while you're in the session, um, it's pretty stressful. So just really, really glad to have booked a win. And um, I'm happy that this whole second trip went much better than my first trip during Monster Meetup Week. I've still got to get some money back, but uh, the plan is to work on that April 26th through May 1st, I'll be out there, and then I'll be back at the Lodge for the Lodge Championship Series in May. Um, the whole series goes from May 4th through the 23rd. I'll be out there for the last week of that, and we're doing a proper meetup game May 22nd with Doug, Andrew, and me. We'll be playing 2-5 all day, and then we'll do something after where we have drinks with everybody on the property. Um, so uh, if you haven't been out to the Lodge, uh, this is a good time to check it out. Um, it's something that should kind of be on every poker player's bucket list in my mind. Very, very special place and uh, they do a great job running all the tournaments and all the cash games. Alright guys, hope you're doing well. Good luck at the tables and I'll see you next time.